Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 327. If your dream doesn't scare you, it isn't big enough. Unknown. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my Indie Film Hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Industry Jump. Industry Jump is a global community of verified filmmakers providing the next generation of filmmakers with the resources required to grow their businesses, learn new skills, and manage their careers. You can sign up for free. You can even create a verified portfolio, search for film crew to hire for your next projects, and learn from top-tier creators in the industry through live video mentoring. So if you want to check this out, guys, head over to IndustryJump.com. Dot com. Today's show is also sponsored by Blackbox. Blackbox is a new platform and community that is all about financial freedom for filmmakers like you. If you join Blackbox, you will be transformed from being a worker to being a maker of your own content. And you'll be making steady passive income from the global market. Blackbox currently allows you to upload your stock footage once, get it to many global agencies, and then allows you to share that passive income stream with your collaborators. Whether you want to submit old footage that's been sitting around in your hard drives or create brand new content, Blackbox is for you. It's really quite revolutionary. With Blackbox, filmmakers can concentrate on making great content while Blackbox takes care of all the business BS. Just visit www.blackbox.global to find out more. Today on the show, we have returning champion Alex Lehman, who is the director of the new Netflix film Paddleton, starring Mark Duplass and Ray Romano. And he's been on the show before on episode 104, actually, a while ago, when he directed uh, Mark Duplass and Sarah Paulson in a Netflix film called Blue Jay, which was his first feature film. And I'd love to bring him back to wanted to see how his career has progressed. Obviously, he's doing okay because uh, he has a new film out on Netflix. And also just wanted to see how the process of working with a scriptment, how do you direct a comedy legend like Ray Romano and work in that environment, this kind of freewheeling, creative environment, and all while doing a Netflix show. So we really get into the weeds a little bit. He drops some really great knowledge bombs. And it's pretty inspirational to see Alex's story and how he's been able to progress from working in the camera department on the league all the way to now directing and making a full-time career of directing and creating projects and uh, just what he's been able to accomplish. It's very, very inspirational as well. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Alex Lehman. I'd like to welcome back to the show returning champion, Alex Lehman. Hey, how you doing, what brother? What did I win? Huh? I win? <laughs> another another forty five minutes to an, You want you got a Yoda? There's a Hulk in the back, some Wolverines, <laughs> maybe an autographed Akira Kurosawa <laughs> poster in the back. <laughs> oh, this is full man cave, man. Full full, around. full man cave, man. Thanks for coming back, brother. I appreciate it. Thank you. I I appreciate being able to talk about myself. Actually, no, I hate talking about myself. But let's talk about filmmaking. your projects, about your projects of filmmaking. So for yes. uh, for those who did not hear your first amazing interview, uh, was about your film uh, Blue Jay with uh, Mark Duplass and Sarah Paulson, which uh, was an amazing film. I love that film uh, when you. I saw it, and uh, and and it was a great interview. I'll put the I'll put that interview in the show notes as well if people want to go back and listen to that one. But for people who don't know who you are, sir, uh, how did you, like a real quick like recap? How did you get into the business? Um, I, uh, well, I've been a DP for a long time. So I got in the business as a cameraman cinematographer. And then I actually met Mark Duplass. I was a cameraman on the league, which I kind of call grad school for, for, I mean, especially for a movie like Paddleton, really, that was grad school for me. Cause I was working with all these, uh, really great comedians, improv, uh, comedians and improv actors. Um, but I was just a cameraman there, but I was on the side, I was making this documentary called Asperger's R Us that I was kind of, I was itching to make something of my own and, uh, I hustled, um, on brand, on brand, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and yeah. And, and so I, you know, made this documentary on a, on a credit card and just kind of was flying out like on hiatus weeks, uh, filming this comedy troupe, uh, called Asperger's Russ out in Boston. 
was cutting the stock together and uh, Mark kind of caught, caught wind and he, he could tell it, it meant a lot to me. So he asked me to see it when it was done and um, he said he wanted to help release it and, and get it out in the world. And then it wasn't, you know, much later that he hit me up and said, Hey, do you want to direct this, this movie um, that I'm thinking of doing? I was like, <laughs> no brainer, probably the easiest, the best open door uh, in Hollywood, you know, history. Mark Duplass says, "Hey, come direct me and Sarah Paulson in this uh, little two hander." It's like, "Yes, please." Yes, please. Yeah, can I have so, another? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yes, yeah, so I DP and directed that one, and then um, he, here we are with Paddleton, which I guess is the other. Yeah. Now it's 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 an interesting. Obviously, it's a very unique story. Not very many people uh, get these these kind of opportunities. And look, a lot of people. I feel uh, lucky. I know there's no question about it. And look, at the end of the day, man, I always tell people like – because there will be people out there listening. They're like, well, you know, maybe if I was on the set of the league, maybe I could have met Mark Duplass. And I, you know, and like, yeah, sure. And I could have made a, a $7,000 action film in, in Mexico and called it El Mariachi and just happened to run into the top directing agent in Hollywood and my career can take off like Robert Rodriguez. Right. It's all about being at the right place at the right time with the right product. And if you wouldn't have had been making – Asperger's Ross, maybe if you wouldn't make that decision, that would have just been another gig for you, right? In many ways. I, I, would, I would agree with that. I mean, we we shared a sensibility of, of the films we liked. And uh, mm-hmm. when we got sick of all the fart and dick jokes on uh, <laughs> on set, you know, we would usually be hanging out at Crafty, talking about feelings or life or, or you know, art films, films that, you know, kind of inspired us. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but yeah, if I didn't show them that I was able to craft a story on my own and, and kind of do out, do this stuff and, and the work ethic, honestly, the, the thing where it was like, okay, great. We're wrapping at 10 o'clock on Friday and I'm taking a red eye so I can start shooting in Boston on my little documentary set Saturday morning. And then sometimes I was getting back to, to set the following Monday on the league without ever having gone home, you know? Um, and he would, he, he saw that he's like, dude, you're busting your, yourself for this. I think that uh, the least I could do is, is watch it. That's awesome. Um, yeah, but, but that, that, but again, you you put the hustle in, you put the work in, uh, and yeah, sure, the opportunity might have been there, but you just got to push hard, man. And and and, and someone like Mark, because I've had God now, I've had everybody but Mark on the damn show. Uh, <laughs> like every director who he's worked with, the people on his uh, that new uh, Seed and Spark show. I had the the, the girl directors, um, not the girl directors, mm-hmm. the amazing directors that happen to be female. They. Yeah, yeah. I know them. They're great. They're, yeah, they actually know you very well. They spoke very highly of you, by the way. Well, they don't have the – okay, sure, whatever. They don't know everything yet. <laughs> exactly. They don't uh, – no, Sweet. They're, they're super sweet. I can't wait to see that movie. They're Did you see that movie? I have not seen the movie yet. I'm dying to yeah, see the movie, but they were just amazing. Yeah. That that interview hasn't even come out yet on the podcast, right, right. but it was so, so great. And uh, it's amazing. The more people I interview who have worked with Mark, uh, I kind of see a pattern. I kind of see a pattern of the people who he likes to work with. I like to see a pattern of uh, the sensibilities, but also the the work ethic is a big, big thing uh, yeah. as well, and and that cannot be underestimated. <laughs> it, yeah, and he's still got the work ethic too, and it, you know he still respects you know the, the the man's made a lot of money, and yet you know he still is um, you know frugal in a lot of ways, and he and he encourages frugality. I was just talking to. Um, to a film critic about this the other day who read Mark's book and really loved it yeah, great book. was more than anything was talking about how like in, how necessary it is for filmmakers to read this and realize like don't extend yourself and your car lease don't go out to too many expensive debt don't do don't spend your money on all these things and then feel like you need to work five jobs to to support yourself because then you don't have any free time to you know go out and take the risks and make your own stuff and and, uh, you know, Mark still, you know, champions that idea. And I think when he recognizes people who are doing that mm-hmm. um, and taking advantage of, of their free time and really just going out there and, and making things and, and, you know, putting their free time and, 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 and leftover energy to that, uh, then he wants to try to help them and, and reward them for applying themselves. Him and Jay are, 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 are probably two of the most unique people in Hollywood. No question. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they're very unique scenarios, very unique opportunity situations, but they 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 busted their bus to get there, man. So God bless. Yeah, there's a lot of unique people in Hollywood. Though. But their specific there's kind of Wood, flavor. You got Caitlyn Jenner. No, 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 no. There's a very unique amount of people in Hollywood, but their specific uh, no, that's what you mean. That's flavor what you mean. of that's filmmaker of is yeah, very no, unique sure. situations. I'm just being a, a smartass and not even funny, <laughs> but uh, yeah, for sure. They're they're yeah they're you know. 
they they put out they've got the right vibe. They they're the kind of like the indie kings, I guess. I mean, I don't want to. Sounds weird for me to say that. Like, I don't okay. want to. Actually, it's, it's actually would sound weird if they said it. So you can say it. It's fine. Uh, well, Mark say that on the interview today. I'm sorry. Mark told me to say that. He said, Obviously. "Call me whatever you say. Just remember to call me the indie <laughs> king of Hollywood." <laughs> If it's you weird. could, please. It, it's weird, but uh, you do whatever the Duplass says. Anyway, so <laughs> when, the, when, the, du, when the Duplass says something, you move. Yes, yes. Can you sir. animate? <laughs> <laughs> we'll throw in the strings and post. Done. And they're like the, the the next Bob Weinstein. Not wait, not not the bad one, but the good one. The Bob Weinstein. <laughs> Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about Asperger's or Us, man, yeah. um, because uh, last time we, you were on, we were really just focused on Blue Jay, but Asperger's or, Honest, kind of, Asperger's or Us kind of took on its own world and its own uh, kind of thing because Blue Jay got a lot of the attention, but then Asperger's came in right after. We, we, it was picked up by Netflix as well, and mm-hmm. I love the way – and we talked a little bit about it in the last interview, but I wanted you to kind of break into how you marketed this. How did you go after you know uh, that audience because – this film is pretty much everything I preach. It's like you identify a market, you identify a group of people who are passionate about something, yeah. and you've niched down to a point where they're going to go after that film and they're going to want to watch and consume that content. So can you tell us a little bit about that process? Yeah, and that's a really great question. Um, there's a couple of things that happen. So obviously, you know, it's a pretty clear niche that that we're working with here, which is um, – Anybody that, that, you know, is on the spectrum or has a family member on the spectrum, which is obviously actually a lot of people at yeah. uh, this day and age. So, um, you know, that, that's helpful. Um, so that was like our base niche for sure. I, I like to think that the movie transcends, people, you know, it transcends, but, uh, that base niche, uh, was, was pretty easy to market to. Um, I started working with a lot of groups. Well, when I was trying to get the movie made, um, I realized that like, there are a lot of autism documentaries and films and like events and everybody's got their own thing. So at that point I wasn't quite getting the, the juice from a lot of the organizations. But once the film was, was done and started getting a little attention in Mark's name and South by Southwest, oh, yeah. all of a sudden like these people come out of the woodwork. So once you kind of prove your metal and, 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 and show that it's, you know, maybe uh, not just, you know, a half baked idea, but there's really something there. The, the group's, do find you to a certain extent. But then I also have to give a huge shout out to um, my friend, uh, uh, Kyle, who, um, uh, and I'll send you a link to, you know, maybe we can like plug him because he yeah, of does a lot of like, um, I met him through, he, he was promoting another friend's film and it was a faith film. And, um, and he's really good at like doing like the online digital marketing, targeting, targeted marketing, all that stuff. And I asked him like, listen, I, I don't have like, budget or anything but like I, you know i've got a little bit but can you kind of help me target audiences and he did it with like facebook and twitter and whatever and and he was able to like really he did stuff with numbers and like tracking where the trailer played and like how it linked up to people i don't know it's like zuckerberg level stuff what's his or, name again uh his name his name is kyle oh, of course uh, kyle was episode, episode number 200 man yeah <laughs> are you kidding me i had kyle on he's amazing that's right. I forgot he worked with you. Of course, Kyle's like a freaking yeah. genius when it comes to Facebook ads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll give you. Yeah, we we should plug him because he's he's really great at all that stuff. And um, uh, uh, anyways, he he helped us get. It. So before it, it came out on uh, Netflix, it actually we got like a month release. Part of our deal with Netflix was like, hey, we can put it out on iTunes, Amazon, DVD, whatever, mm-hmm. and. Uh, we like rose up. We were like the number two documentary on iTunes for like a week. And it was all because like Kyle was like tweaking these numbers. So everybody's got to find their Kyle is what I'm saying. Or you could but, just call Kyle. Kyle's available. Call Kyle. Uh, <laughs> and, and he's a great filmmaker as well. Yeah, he but, is. And he's been uh, producing some stuff. But he's really good at that targeting stuff. And I, I, I don't know much about it. I can't speak to the specifics of it. All I know is this guy um, who – he was, just, he was just a buddy of ours and had done my buddy's faith film. He, he got it. And by the way, he connected with the film. So that helped also. He saw, he saw it and was like, I see a lot of myself in this and my friends in this and I get it and um, I want to help you. And so, again, he just knobs, numbers, algorithms, whatever, special sauce. And uh, before you know it, um, you know, he's just basically connected the film with its base audience uh, through the Internet 
which I don't know much about. I'm not even on social media. I'm a Luddite. <laughs> so that's why I'm like both telling you this is really important and a great question. And I know that it was – It means <laughs> I, something. I, I just – it happened, but I don't know how it happened. Um, um, but then you look at Netflix and it's the same thing. I mean, like they're obviously the reason they're, they're so successful is, um, because they know how to connect audiences with material. So if you make a niche film, they go, we can target those people because algorithms and AI viewing habits and all that stuff. Sure. Yeah. I'm really scared of that stuff. Like it's either Amazon (laughs) or Netflix is going to be the cause of terminator actually happening like it's frightening it's frightening it's, when i went to when i went to a meeting with them um for the pre-release of paddleton they uh were in this like big conference room it feels like very dr strange love already there's like, all the people, you're, like no fighting out. no fighting like, in the war room there's like a little camera that's like under the monitor and it's like sometimes it's like turning they're like oh yeah it's some of the other executives that are watching the meeting and like <laughs> big what? brother very big brother exactly very big brother and then there's this map is a map that fills up the screen and it is a world map. Sure. And there's lines that are going from like every country, almost every country. <laughs> so it's, what, it's, it's literally Dr. Strangelove. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I was like, this is how the world is going to end because like at some – first Netflix figures out what movies we like and then they kind of figure out what our tendencies are as humans. And then they, uh, you know, they enslave us. They'll do something to make it so that we don't leave our homes. Oh, wait. Uh-huh. That already happens. Exactly. Uh, they're halfway there. <laughs> And then, you know, and we pay for the privilege and we pay for the privilege. That's right. (laughs) Missile launches. It's going to it's all going to happen. I'm really I'm afraid. But, you know, until then, watch Paddleton. I don't know. We're going to get we're going to get to Paddleton in a minute because I'd love the film and we're going to talk about it. But I want to touch real quick upon Blue Jay. How was that film received? I mean, obviously, I mean, it has an amazing cast with with um, with Sarah and and Mark. Uh, It was a black and white kind of just love story, you know, very beautiful kind of quiet, quiet, two person, black and white. Yeah. Slow, like no plot. Am yeah. I selling it right now? <laughs> you're, you're doing fantastic job, sir. It's, <laughs> Leave it to Kyle and me to market you, sir, because obviously you're not, that's not your wheelbarrow. I'm not a pump guy. I'm not a hype guy. Uh, it, it was, it was well received by the people who, who saw it. And that's a niche film for sure. Very I mean, much. think about how many, you know, how much, of a Netflix audience is going to see it and immediately turn it off just because it's black and white. And I get it. That's fine. Um, then there's, you know, other people that are going to be like, well, it's a love story and like not that much happens in it. And, you know, and, and if they don't know one of the only two actors, even though like Sarah Paulson and Mark Duplass are big stars, if you don't know who those two people are, you might turn it off just because of that. That's how the business works. Um, there's all these things that we do to try to make a movie, um, uh, hook someone from the very beginning and, it, and it's, you know, look, stars, conceit, you know, but if none of those things work and when, and, and when all your things are, you know, black and white, two actors, very simple love story, a lot of people are, aren't going to watch it, but the people that watch it loved it. Um, I think more people have watched it than I uh, expected mm-hmm. and that excites me and I hope even more people will watch it now that, you know, Paladin, uh comes out because I think that's kind of uh, getting a broader audience. It seems like it's it's being targeted to yeah. a broader audience. When's that come so, out, by the way, the film? I'm sorry? When does Paddleton come out again? Uh, Friday. This oh. Friday, the 22nd. So oh, awesome. I'm sorry, probably uh, by the time this airs, last Friday, the 22nd? Maybe last Friday? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, that's what I think so. I think some, <laughs> something like that. Um, all right, so what was the biggest lesson you learned uh, directing Blue Jay? Since it was directing. like your first big narrative. Yeah, yeah, directing Blue Jay, the, the, the lesson I learned is that um, well, I'm, I'm going to give you two. Mm-hmm. I'm so bad at answering questions. I'm going to give you two. One is um, you don't have to have all the answers. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you should be prepared. You should be prepared with, you know, your plan and all the answers you can think of. But when new things come up, you don't have to have all the answers because you're probably working with some really talented people, great producers, great DP, great, you know, actors, great first AD Mm -hmm. sound, you don't know who's going to maybe come up with that answer. So don't try to do, you know, try, try to, you know, don't be lazy and rely on other people, but at the same time, don't be closed off to the fact that someone else in this collaborative process might bring a great idea to you. And don't be threatened by that because that's just the nature of, of, of filmmaking. It's Mm -hmm. a collaborative process. So, um, it was both, 
hard and a complete relief to realize that um, I didn't have to do everything myself. Because that's what I kind of did do with my documentary, mm-hmm. where was shooting, editing, sound, or just everything, you know, uh, until Kyle came along. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, so that was a really great lesson to learn. Um, and it made me feel more excited about making movies in the future and think about like, gosh, if I can hire uh, this girl or this guy or whatever, like I love, you know, the way she shot this and I love the way, you know, this AD works on set and like, oh my gosh, my movie would be even better if I get to have all these people around me. So like, you know, realize that like it is about surrounding yourself with talented people and um, getting everything out of them and then taking credit for it later and never admitting <laughs> that any of the ideas weren't <laughs> But until then, <laughs> but until then, just soak up all those great ideas. Uh, yeah, obviously, I'm, I'm I'm kidding. Give them all the credit you can. Absolutely, absolutely. But at the end of the day, you know, wh- whether you like it or not, a lot of times they do give you you're the director, so they give you the credit, even if it was a PA who gave you the idea on set that day. You know, it it's is weird, man. It, it is because especially at like film festivals, oh, have yeah. like the director come up and present the film, and so, at some festivals they only want the director and the stars to come up for the Q and A, and it's like, yo, there are a lot of talented people that had something to do with this. Right. And, you know, maybe the thing you liked best about my movie wasn't even my idea. Um, you know, uh, right. I hope it was no, it, yeah. doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like, but like you want to get all those people on stage and you want to remind people like, Hey, mm-hmm. um, that's the, but that it's the great thing about directing. It's also the, the, it can be the really crappy thing about directing once you're doing that collaborative thing, because, uh, you know, actors are going to make choices and producers, editors, and, yeah, sure. And editors and, and, uh, studios are going to say, well, we don't want the film to go in this direction and you have to take the good with the bad. And it mostly is good, but you got to take the good and the bad realizing that like there's, you know, if you want, if you want to be an auteur, you know, write a novel. Don't. <laughs> right. Exactly. Like literally. Right. Yeah. Or make, um, or make like a $3,000 feature film or something like that. something that you can completely do yourself and control yeah, yourself. You got to star in it yourself. I mean, if you really want, you know, <laughs> exactly. you really want it to be just you, like it's, there has, been this, there has been those movies. I mean, it's called um, The Room. But uh, <laughs> Yeah, worked out great. Hey, you know what? He's doing all right. He's doing all right. Um, now, real quick, uh, Asperger's or Us is actually taking a new life, right? Yes, but hold on. Uh, the yeah. other lesson I just oh. want to share real quickly is that um, you know when you start working, and I think this applies to your audience a lot, when you start working with actors who are maybe better known or have like – bigger careers or a lot more credits under the belt, you might assume that it's not hard for them or it's not terrifying. But the thing to realize is um, whether it's a first time actor or, or a hundredth time actor, if they're a professional, if they're a true craftsperson, um, they're going to be a little bit terrified to be completely vulnerable and reveal themselves. Right. Um, on screen in front of a camera, just as a performance, even theatrically. And you have to always be, be there for them. And that was a, that was a lesson for me because, you know, I'm working with Mark Duplass and Sarah Paulson thinking like, well, they don't need positive reinforcement. These guys have to know how great they are. And I really quickly learned that like, they still need to hear. Mm -hmm. And it's not because they have, you know, like crazy egos or anything. It's just because they're putting themselves out there in, in a really difficult way as actors do um as good actors do you you have to let them know like you're good working you're doing you're doing a good job even if i have a note for you i'm gonna first let you know what's working and i'm gonna thank you i'm gonna find intelligent and honest ways to thank you for for being so vulnerable on screen for this story that i want to tell Awesome. It's very important. And also just to keep a safe space for them. Create a space environment for them as a director, I think is a huge deal as well. As they, if they don't feel comfortable that you've got their back, mm-hmm. they're not going to give you the best. They're going to hold back and they're just going to protect They're going to protect themselves. Right. Yep. Now, you, uh, Asperger's or Us actually has taken a new life, hasn't it? Yeah. So this is exciting. We shot a docu-series uh, a while ago. Um, uh, we put the guys uh, – it's the same guys from the original documentary. We mm-hmm. put them – in an RV, uh, an old RV that <laughs> maybe had a few mechanical issues along its 6,000 mile uh, journey across the United States, booked them some really cool venues and um, they performed for all sorts of different audiences that they really hadn't performed for before. And uh, 
it's a comedy and, and there's still, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of heart to it. Um, as these guys kind of reveal themselves, you know, similarly to our films, you know, a good documentary, you, you make your documentary subject feel safe. Yeah. Uh, it's coming out on HBO at the end of April. Little company, just, little known company. It's just, you know, they're just starting yeah, yeah, yeah. Little yeah. company, HBO. It's a new uh, streaming it's service. Part. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> so bad at promoting stuff. It's a six part series. It's yeah. a, they're half hours. Uh, and you know, uh, super proud of them. Cool, um, man. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's been kind of nice. And I was through, through Duplass again. I mean, there's the doc did well. And Mark just kind of said, like, do you want to do a series with them? And I said, yeah. So I feel very lucky. I feel very, very lucky. I know these opportunities don't always, right. you know, up for us. Uh, and in fairness, like there were a couple other times in my career where I thought like, oh, this is the thing. This is the door. And it right. would like, slam in my face oh. or break my nose or like, oh, yeah. or like doorknob would hit me in the crotch when it slammed, you know, like there were plenty of times where I thought that there was going to be that moment where my you know career would change um, that, that didn't happen. And, and all I can say is you, you just keep throwing those irons in the fire and, Wear a cup. <laughs> That's a good, you know, that should be a t-shirt. <laughs> What's the biggest advice you have in the film industry? Wear a cup. Just wear, just wear a cup. That's the best advice. I, I am going to steal that, Alex. I'm, I'm sorry. That is going to be, you can have it. Absolutely. I'm, I'm going to steal that one. I think honestly, you should, uh, you should brand, you should just get cups and brand them. You know, you got the hustle. <laughs> the hustle cups cup, you know. for yeah, your chuck. <laughs> Yeah. Sir, what are you talking about? You are a marketing genius. That right there. It's called wow. about it's merchandising. It's all about merchandising. Indie yeah. film hustle, the flamethrower is coming out soon. Um <laughs> so let's talk about Palatin, man. Um and uh, it, it is it I saw it. I uh, I was lucky enough to see an early uh, screening of it. I loved it. I really it, it is a it is a <laughs> I can't say it's a it's it's a feel good film, but kind of, but uh, you know, there's things that happen. It's a, it, I loved it you because say it, you hate it. It's fine. I get. It. I no 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 no. I don't know. I actually loved it. I love the performances of it. I was watching it just not only for the story, but how. I mean, obviously, I'm watching how you made the film. What what's the style? Like why are you doing certain things? Uh, but the performances were great. It stars uh, Ray Romano, little up and coming guy, and uh, and and Mark Duplass again. That I must- think Ray, I think Ray's brother actually put it best. You know, Ray Ray told me recently his brother watched it. He was not in the in the business, but he was mm-hmm. like, and he does. And, and Ray was like, "Listen, my brother doesn't like anything I do." Uh, and don't expect much. He really likes the movie, but he goes, "Yeah, it was it was really good. I mean, it was sad, <laughs> but it was really good." <laughs> and 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 it's like yeah like I don't know I don't like I'm afraid to tell people to watch it because you're gonna laugh for a while and then you're probably gonna be sad and you're gonna probably cry a little bit no it is it is a it, I that you were sad but yeah I love the characters I love the way they interact with each other Ray and Mark are wonderful together like that's a yeah. match made in heaven uh, I, I'm imagining working with someone like Ray who is you know I mean he's a legend in the comedy world and, and you know what was that like like how do you He's a wonderful human being. Yeah, he's, I, I, yeah. He's just he's he's he's. I mean, he's uh super. You know, I and mean, he's really neurotic. He's right. Like <laughs> he's Raymond. He's Raymond. Right, you see his sitcom, and like it's it's who he is. You know, it's a version of of who he is, and um, it's obviously like all that stuff is heightened for for the comedy of it. But like, there's a lot of Ray in in what he does. Everything he does is really genuine, um, and um. He's, you know, he's just really funny, but he's uh, a strong, dramatic actor. We were doing improv. So, you know, uh, having Mark and Ray do improv is kind of amazing. Yeah, I was going to ask you this. How, how much of this film was kind of that whole Duplass improv style? Like, I mean, you had a script, obviously, but then you rolled off of it. Or did you have a scriptment? How did that work? We had a scriptment, yeah. So we, it was, okay. you know, like 30-page, you know, treatment. It's outline. so brilliant that, you, that oh. you made a movie with Ray and Mark for Netflix. It's a scriptment. I mean, it's true. It's uh, it's it's not it's not always that you can like tell people like, well, we have this outline for a movie, but trust us. Um, and that you know, but that speaks to you know Netflix trust, and that speaks to 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 the you know race they, trust. Yeah, race race new to this gang. Race trust for sure. But it but it, you know, it's Netflix's respect for for Mark and what he does, and it's Ray's respect for Mark and what he does because Mark's been doing it forever. It's his. You know, it's it's his brand, it's his career, and so he's basically this this you know creative uh, uh, safety net or backstop or whatever you want to say, where people go, 
I'm willing to believe that this will work out well because I can look at togetherness. I can look at all these movies he's done. I can look at all these things that, that Mark has succeeded with in a, in a similar fashion. And I think that these guys can pull it together. And Blue so, Jay was like that as well. And Blue Jay was like that to go. So we basically, we went to Netflix and said, we want to kind of do another Blue Jay. There's a little bit more outlined because it's a little bit more plot and stuff. And it's color. And it's color. <laughs> and it's color. We're giving you color this time. So, you know. <laughs> exactly. Now, the one thing I did notice about the film was it, it has a very indie vibe to it. I mean, it's literally almost 95% of the movie is two guys on screen, mm-hmm. which yeah. is magnetic. And it's wonderful, the, the banter and the way they, they come back and forth. And Ray's, oh, yeah, yeah. His, um, Ray's neurotic <laughs> energy and, and Mark's energy just, just, it just works so well together. Um, it, you kept it very indie, and I'm assuming the budget, and we won't talk the numbers, but but generally the budget, I'm assuming, is less than 25 mil. <laughs> uh, eh, okay. They were like, if you give Ray and Mark superpowers, we'll give you 50 mil. But if <laughs> exactly. capes. Exactly. But if they don't have superpowers and capes, you're going to have to make it for under 25 mil. And, exactly. But it does have a very indie vibe to it, the way you, the style of it, that you shot it. I mean, if you replace the two main movie stars with just two unknown actors, you've got like an indie Sundance indie kind of movie, even though this, this, this play at Sundance. Uh, but you know what I mean? It just, yeah, it, yeah, was, sure. it was wonderfully done. And you could, and, and to think a lot of filmmakers in your position would, when you had, you know, had success with your your documentary you had success with blue jay this next and mark too for that matter they could ask for more money they could ask for a much larger budget make bigger spectacle even if it's a small story but yet you guys chose to keep it no let's let's just keep it down exactly where it needs to be for this story correct yeah i mean i would say part of that has to do with with what this story is i mean it's a story about two guys that live in these pretty crummy little apartments, you know, they don't have anything. They don't have many material possessions. They don't have, you know, friends outside of each other. They, they don't have big lives outside of each other. Um, they live a really simple life. And that's a lot of the beauty of the film is it's just, you know, showing how what they have, their personal connection is, is enough for them. And, and, and is really, you know, is a life well lived and it's a really satisfying and, and full life without material possessions. So, I mean, it would be kind of weird to make this like gigantic <laughs> cinematic universe for, for what is essentially just a couple guys in these apartments who go on a little road trip and stay in a cheap motel. And, you know, like we can't, the biggest thing, the biggest thing in the movie is that drive in movie theater, uh, the, yeah. the wall that they play the, the palace right. game. And we actually try to make sure to show like how friggin' big this is. And when they go on the road trip a couple of times, we try to have like a shot that shows like how little their car is and how big the rest of the world is right. just for a second, uh, you know, to, to, to kind of remind everybody that like these guys live in a small, simple world. So, yeah, I mean, uh, we, we wanted to make this film look a little, um, a little more polished or a little more big than, than Blue Jay. But, uh, but we didn't want the world to feel big, so. Yeah, w- without question. And you, of course, visited uh, one of my favorite towns in California, and uh, Sylvain, which was – when I saw it, I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe – I'm, I'm sure someone has shot there, but I haven't seen it. People don't really – and I, that was weird because I've always wanted to make a movie there since the first time I of course. took a little weekend vacation there. And, uh, tell it, by the way, can you tell everybody what, cause you and I know what it is, but can you tell everybody what it is? Sylvain is this like, it's just like weird little, it's up in wine country. It's, it's next to San Inez. It's like right by where they shot sideways. So mm-hmm. it's like wine country in, in, in Southern California. But, uh, there's all these, yeah, towns of vineyards and restaurants and whatever, and, and farms. And then there's this one town, Solvang, <laughs> that looks like it was airdropped. This is, it's like out of Denmark, just like one <laughs> town, like a claw came down, grabbed a whole little town. And then, like, helicoptered it over the United States and just airdropped it in Southern California. Yeah. All the, all the, you know, the windmills. All, like, it's, it's all windmills and, 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 like, these tile facades and it's the Hans Christian Andersen Museum. It's a weird <laughs> fish out of water town yeah. that you gotta love. And at the same time, you're like, what is this place? And, um, and even when we were scouting it, I kept going, I kept, like, on my phone, I'd, like, scout on Wikipedia, just anywhere. I'd be like, I'd, I'd be, like, looking the web, looking at the web, going, like, how did nobody make a movie here? It's close enough to LA. Yeah. No one's made a movie there. 
it's been like an episode of like one or two random TV shows that shot there for like a tiny bit. Um, and then sideways basically shot there, but they didn't use that town. They used the stuff around that town. So no, uh, it was absurd to me. Yeah. It was like, you know, finding, you know, a little. Yeah. Cause I, I never remember. I mean, I've been to that town a ton of times since I've lived in Los Angeles and, and I've, I've always like, Oh, they must've shot something here. I mean, they have to have, cause it's just such a unique yeah. location there is nothing so like it in the entire value. state oh so much yeah. production value yeah, yeah. and then of course you shot and great pancakes. i'm sorry and great pancakes fantastic pancakes <laughs> during christmas time it is fantastic there like it's beautiful during christmas time um but you also shot one of my other favorite landmarks in california ostrich land which is down the street from solvane and it's just yeah. i saw that scene that you have in there with and for everybody listen there's literally a it's kind of like, and I don't want to call it like a tourist trap, but it, cause it, 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 it lends itself to being like a little tourist trap, little side sure. road thing. But you walk in and it seems tourist trappy because you like walk in and there's like ostrich feathers and ostrich eggs for sale and all this little thing. And you got to walk through the, um, the, uh, the gift shop to get to the ostriches. And when you walk outside, there's hundreds of ostriches. All around, and it's just like something you again. Where where else are you going to see that? And you get to feed them and all that kind of stuff. It's amazing. Honestly, that that place is uh, uh, so peaceful for me. And oh, I remember we were, we were filming. I mean, when we were finally filming the movie, like by the time we got to that scene, it was like the end of like a pretty intense week, stressful shooting, uh, a lot of other stuff. You know, we we done during the day, so it's just kind of like trying to find that moment of calm as you do as a director. Where you're like, oh god, like you know emotions anxiety everything and, and and we just step onto the the ostrich farm that we'd scouted a few times and i felt at peace these these birds are like uh, it feels like you're with these dinosaurs you know you right. feel connected to like just just nature <laughs> millions of nature and millions of years it's just all there and like they're kind of peaceful animals and kind of not peaceful animals <laughs> and so you're like you pull know. out you pull out one of those bowls you'll see how unpeaceful they are <laughs> <laughs> yeah i wanted to go ride one they're like you cannot ride there's no up. riding of the ostriches we're yeah. we're not in the 1700s sorry yeah <laughs> it made me happy it was like this weird place i was like i never i always thought ostriches were kind of weird and and like i didn't quite get them and then spending a little time with them i realized uh that i loved them and that they were like kind of sweet and beautiful and um and and just peaceful and, and meant a lot Kind of like our characters. Yeah, the but no, they're very. Yeah, I saw the. I saw that kind of mirror image of of these characters. If they were animals, I think ostriches would be a good, uh, a good power animal for them. Oh, yeah. Now, now, what is the process of writing with with Mark on on something like that? What like how is the process of coming up with something like this? Did you come up with the idea? Did he come up with the idea? Did you guys come together? Like we're going to write something, or how did that whole process work? I'm curious. Well, um, yeah, it was this. I mean. It was this, this, we kind of knew what characters we've been chasing a few ideas and there were a couple of things that we'd kind of written and, uh, thought maybe we were going to make and then it, it just was never quite feeling right. Um, but we knew we wanted to make, I mean, we, we like similar characters and we obviously like character driven stuff, but we, we, we wanted to kind of explore these guys that are, um, maybe often overlooked, uh, who are, you know, maybe for, for lack of a better word, and I hate to use the word, uh, about people, but like, but weird. You go like you see this guy walk into a grocery store or whatever, and you go, you know, that's he's a guy with the fanny pack and the weird shoes and like the mustache or whatever. And we judge them like we don't want to judge them, but we do. We judge them a little bit, and we think this person's probably a little strange. And um, I don't want to start a conversation with them. Um, I don't know how to start a conversation with them, and mm -hmm. I don't know if this person is, you know, a serial killer or a creep or whatever. But we we do. But you judge we with yeah. ourselves. We judge them. And, um, they're, they're, they're people, <laughs> they're people and the, they don't get their stories told very much. And so we are like, let's tell a story about those guys. And like, let's, let's, let's tell a story about like how there's two of them and they found each other and they get each other. And like, even if most people don't get them and even if they are kind of like a little afraid of the rest of the world or like, just don't feel like they need the rest of the world. They don't need social media. They don't need clubs and, 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 and parties and stuff. They don't need big groups of friends, they need each other and they get each other in a way that makes life feel complete. 
And then obviously you got to take that away from them or threaten to take it away from them so that there's drama. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of how we developed the idea. And then, uh, you know, the process, you know, I'd write a draft, send it to Mark. He would, you know, take a pass on it and we'd kind of built it out and it got bigger and bigger. And then um, and then we made it a little bit smaller before we sent it out to Ray. We took out some of the character stuff to really make sure because it's kind of unique the way we, you know, mm. we make films like Blue Jay where it's like. It's so character driven. And when you're going out to Sarah Paulson or Ray Romano, you want to give them something that's really exciting, like the opportunity to stretch their own character, stretch, make their make their own thing. And so um, I guess I guess basically we stripped out some of the Andy character, send it to, uh, you know, some just some of the color. And we, we send it to, to Ray and, and go like, here's a story. Here's a sense of what these guys are, what the relationship is. And. You know, and then he says, I want to do it. And then he starts building out uh, Andy's character. In fact, he, um, you know, at that point, he he emailed us like this whole backstory of uh, Andy, like a long, beautiful backstory, his childhood, his parents, all that stuff. And it fits perfectly into who this character Andy would be now. And, uh, you know, at that point, Mark and I know that Ray gets the character and he's going to bring all sorts of stuff to it. And uh you rock and roll. Yeah, yeah, rock and roll. And then there's like bits, like the ostrich, like the the yeah. the, the ostrich bit and the um the halftime speech. There's stuff like that where Ray, you know, while we're in prep, still Ray goes like, "Oh, I got this halftime speech idea," and and I go like, "Okay, like that's that makes sense. That 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 embodies what our film is. So like, let's find a place for it. We'll put it at the bar, and then we'll kind of build up to it, getting to the bar, and then maybe there'll be a payoff like later on." the ostrich thing. I'm like, listen, we scout, we were scouting and we realized there was an ostrich farm right down the street. I feel like that should be a stop on the road trip. And then, you know, he says like, I got a couple of bits for it and we'll try it. And <laughs> so it's kind of this organic thing where we're, that's we're awesome. Prep, we're improving where we shoot. And then, you know, and then in post, we're basically hoping that our editor's a genius and helps us figure out, uh, what to use. Yeah. I, I, I've, I've shot two films like that now, you know, being inspired by Mark and, and I tell you, it is a wonderfully uh, freeing experience as a filmmaker to do these kind of films. It's just kind of like, let's see what happens. It's just like you're playing, like you're playing, uh, but you get to play in a, in a larger sandbox with larger, uh, you know, Barbie dolls. If you will. <laughs> I hate to call Mark and Ray Barbie, but you know what I mean? With larger, with larger set pieces. Uh, but yeah, it's still the same that you just get out there and go out and play. And I think it's a wonderful way of, you know, a wonderful way of making films. Um, now I want to ask you a question. Uh, I didn't ask you this last time, but I want to see what you, th- what you say. Yeah. Did you ever have to break through a fear, uh, when you were trying to get into filmmaking or, you know, I'm assuming when Mark called you and said, Hey, you want to go make this movie? I got to believe there must have been, yeah. am I ready? Can I, like, if I fail, it's over. Like if I fail at this kind of level, it's over. Like uh, th- that's what would go through my head. Like, you know, if, if all of a sudden Martin Scorsese calls me, he's like, Hey, I want to produce a movie with you and we're going to give you 20 million or $50 million with Leonardo DiCaprio. I'm not throwing this all out there, but at a certain point you're like, Congratulations, I, by the way. That's I awesome. that would be we should fantastic. Talk about that, movie. that we should actually, but you know, but like you have to break through that whole, like, am I, am I ready? Am, am I good enough? I got to believe you had to go through something like that. It's terrifying. Um, <laughs> I love that. I love that delivery, by the way. It's, just, it's terrifying. It's just terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a horrible feeling. It's a horrible. It's a, great, it's a horrible feeling. You're like, yeah, you get the ask or you get your thing green later. All of a sudden, or it's like, all right, uh, Netflix, uh, Duplass, Romano, we're doing it again. It's going to be bigger. And you go like, this is awesome. How are we going to make this work? <laughs> right. So, so even, even after Blue Jay. <laughs> okay. Like now that we got Ray, um, I feel like I should help them find a better director <laughs> or a director, somebody who's done it more. I don't I mean, know. There yeah. has to be more qualified people than me. <laughs> I mean, I made, I made, it's all joking, obviously to sure. deflect the, the very real fears that we have. And, and to be honest, when Mark had asked me to do blue Jay, he emailed me. He's like, I'm looking for like a, a director slash DP who could, you know, helm this. Here's the out, you know, it was like a two page outline. This is what I'm kind of thinking of doing. Great email. I almost wrote him back and said, uh, and I actually had the email written at the time. I was like, uh, I don't, or, or I, I, the email was, uh, yeah, I can, I can recommend a few people for you. <laughs> and I was like, don't make that joke. 
I was like, but it's funny. She's like, yeah, but it's dumb because like you might be passing up your opportunity. Like, don't even make that joke. But obviously, it's coming from a place of, uh, yeah, I don't know why you're asking me, but I feel lucky that you're asking me. But um, it's going to take a while for me to feel like I belong here, and I might never completely feel like I belong here. But that goes back to like telling you that you know when Sarah Paulson or Ray Romano tell me like they're a little afraid of doing this improv thing, um, and I look at their credits list, I'm like, why are you afraid of anything? I have to remember that we're all human and yeah. like we're all constantly trying to find things that, that are challenging. Uh, if, if not, you know, I mean, it's a cheesy saying, but you're either growing or you're dying. So if you're not, if you're not doing things that are challenging, you're going to get complacent real quickly and you're not going to, your, your work's going to be stale and it's going to be, you know, at best derivative. Um, there won't be any heart in it and, and you're not going to be uh, doing good work. You, you might just be, possibly faking, you know, faking emotion and, and getting craft out there at best. Right. right. So yeah, you got to push yourself and that means doing things that scare you. So yeah, I was, I was absolutely scared. I'm scared on most of the things I do. And what, what, what are the, what do you do to break through that? Like what, what are the, what are, is there any specific thing you just go like, I got, I just got to go. Just do it. Yeah. Just do it. In fact, to be completely honest, there's this new thing I've been, you know, I've been writing a couple of things, but one, one thing I've been writing is like, basically the opposite of a two hander. It's like, uh, you know, a, a apocalypse level, uh, scenario. It just involves like so many characters and so much in the world. And I'm looking at this going like, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this at all. This is terrifying. And I asked, um, I've got this, you know, really great, uh, uh, writing mentor through, through WGA and I called him up and, uh, you know, he's written like huge movies and he's super nice, but he just goes, why are you afraid? Just write, like, just, just write, just do it. Just, the the you know. paper's not going to bite you. Just do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so obviously, you know, writing is a little less scary than being on set, but like being on set is less scary than, I don't know, uh, performing heart surgery or brain surgery. Like at, at, at the end of the day, you have to look around and appreciate that you aren't there by yourself, that you are there with, you know, I can go, well, I don't know if I deserve to be on um, a Ray Romano movie. Like, that's kind of a big deal. And then I realized, like, but it's a big deal because Ray Romano is here to be Ray Romano also. And so, like, he's going to carry some of that weight. I don't have to make Ray Ray. Ray's already Ray. I just have to do my thing and, and remember to appreciate all the great things that Ray does. Remember to appreciate all the great things that Mark does. And um, by not – this goes back – to to what I was telling you earlier, which is like you don't have to have all the answers, you don't have to do all the things. You get to kind of celebrate the the, the creativity and talent around you, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, some of that pressure goes away. And uh, if it's like the right amount of pressure that's off of you, but if it's the right amount of challenge that's on you, that makes you feel fresh and like kind of alive and you know driven, excited, then it's I think it's that perfect little formula of you know. I'm, I'm going to do something special. I'm at least going to give it everything I got. And I'm not going to get in my own way. That's um, awesome. So, yeah. Now, and um, lastly, last question, man. What uh, what did you learn uh, with with writing and directing Pendleton? What was the lesson you learned? The biggest lesson. The biggest lesson I learned on Pendleton. Be aware of the ostrich. <sighs> Beware of the ostrich. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I got so many directions. I, I could like make a another dumb joke, but I think you've got enough of those for me today. <laughs> um, I, you know, and I don't want to repeat the lessons I learned on Blue Jay because then it makes it sound like I'm not, not growing. Like, you're dying. You're dying. You're not dying. growing. Um, yeah, I would say uh, be you know both both on the process of the film and 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 the subject matter of the film. Um, you know, letting go is terrifying and, uh, control, uh, letting go of control is, is terrifying. But, um, when you love things and when you love people, you have to, you know, understand how to celebrate them and, um, appreciate them and do the most with what you've got. But, uh, be able to, you know, let go at the same time. 
Awesome. Awesome, man. Uh, and I normally ask a whole bunch of questions, but I've already asked all those questions of you before. So uh, what, just let's talk about uh, where- cheese, green and uh, Nirvana <laughs> and, uh, and an oak tree. Uh, <laughs> what kind of tree would you be if you would be a tree? Um, the uh, where can people. F- uh, so the movie could be on that. Net- it's on Netflix and it comes out February 22nd. OK. And I would ask where people could find you, but you're not on social media or rarely, if any at all. So there's that. If they, if they really want to find me, they can, they can do some deep some digging talking. They can do some deep digging and I'm sure they'll find my email address somewhere, but, uh, or call uh, Kyle or just call Kyle. Call Kyle. <laughs> I don't like giving anybody's, I don't like, you know, whatever. It's, no, Kyle already gave me all his information. I'll put it in the show notes. So it's all okay, good. Call Kyle and then Kyle will forward it to me. <laughs> Great. Alex, yeah. man, man, listen, man, congratulations on all your success, man. It couldn't happen to a nicer guy, really, truly. And keep making these cool films, man. Uh, honestly, keep making some good stuff. And, uh, you say so. Uh, all right. Yeah. You, you, <laughs> honestly, man, you're an inspiration to a lot of filmmakers out there. I know our first, po- our first ep- episode that we did together did really well and people were really inspired by it. So keep up the good work, brother. And thanks for, uh, thanks for dropping some, uh, knowledge bombs on the tribe today. Thank you. Uh, good luck with everything you're, do- thank you for everything you're doing. And, uh, most importantly, good luck with the uh, the hustle cups. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Thanks. I want to thank Alex for coming on the show and dropping some awesome knowledge bombs on the tribe today. Thank you, Alex. And continued success on your career, man. You are an inspiration. So thanks again for coming by. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 327. And if you haven't already, please head over to filmmakingpodcast.com and leave a good review for the show. It really, really helps us out a lot. I want to get this information out to as many filmmakers and screenwriters as humanly possible. And that's the end of another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope it was of value to you. Have a great weekend. And as always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 